So the next speaker is Aubrey, as I already mentioned. He is a biomedical gerontologist who is based in Silicon Valley in California, USA, and he's the president and chief science officer of the new uh, LEV Foundation, uh, which is focused on biomedical research and advocacy for uh, repairing the molecular and cellular damage of aging. I give the word to Aubrey. Uh, thanks very much, Ben. Yeah, so um, uh, Didier asked me to speak about specifically the advocacy initiatives of LEV Foundation. Of course, we are, as Ben mentioned, also doing a bunch of research. Um, so that's what I'll do over the next 20 minutes or so. Um, and let me make the thing actually work. There we go. But first of all, just let me uh, highlight the wonderful people that I've been able to recruit as the founding team um, at LEVF. These are people that many of you already know, and you will increasingly know them as time goes on, but I won't spend any time on that right now. Um, the directors are also a bunch of absolutely stellar people, including the next two speakers, Daria and Martin. Um, and again, most of you know these people, and those of you who don't will be meeting them over the next month, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, but in terms of advocacy and education, which kind of are very closely linked things, of course, as many of you know, um, my uh, work in this area has very highly um, uh, highlighted the uh, role of conferences. And I believe that that's going to continue, that the conferences which happen in this space, whether it's EHA or RADVEST or whatever, are absolutely fundamental in um, taking this community forward and in growing this community. And of course, um, as I would say, I, I think that my own conferences are the best of all um, because of the, uh, I don't know, the diversity and the uh, emphasis on recreational, the recreational components, things like that. So of course we had a conference in um, September in Dublin, which a number of people who are in the audience today attended and it was a blowout success. And I'm uh, delighted to say that the next conference will happen in Dublin next September. Uh, the exact date and venue will be uh, publicized very, very soon. Um, we're just finalizing the contract right now, but um, yeah, mark your calendars because it's definitely going to be back. Um, so as I said, I'm not gonna talk much about research today. I, talk, I talked about it quite a bit in Dublin and at various other talks that are online, um, but I would particularly just want to highlight the first one of these, our combination late onset damage repair program. The idea here is to um, achieve robust mass rejuvenation as fast as we possibly can. And um, we believe that we've got a fair chance of doing it in only a few years now. Uh, we are going to be doing it in collaboration with the most successful of Sense Research Foundation's spin-out companies, Icor Therapeutics. Um, I bought a thousand mice last week, um, which is going to be the, um, the substrate for the very first round of this. We're going to be combining four rejuvenation interventions in various different um, combinations and uh, measuring not only longevity, but of course, um, various aspects of health span. We're going to be starting the study at 18 months of age. And this has some similarity to some of the work that other groups are doing, such as the Rejuvenome project at the Buck Institute. But the big difference is that we are doing rejuvenation uh, things, which they are basically not. The um, other groups that are working in this area are focusing on orally available interventions. And you know we just don't think that's going to cut it, so we're being braver. But that's all I'm going to say about research today, because I want to get on to the various things that we have been doing and are doing in the advocacy and education arenas. And um, I mentioned all of these things in Dublin briefly, but I'm going to spend a bit more time on each of them uh, right now. Um, so first of all, less death. So um, this is something that uh, was a big highlight of what I did uh, under cover of darkness, so to speak, over the past year before uh, LEV Foundation was launched. And it was a retreat that occurred last uh, August, if, if I'm not mistaken, in um, the mountains outside of the Bay Area. And it was an enormous amount of fun, as you can see here, but it was much more than fun. The idea of this retreat was to bring in a whole bunch of newcomers to the field who would 
um, have, you know, the right kind of dedication and interest in getting involved and who would have various types of expertise, uh, but who would not necessarily know exactly how to make a contribution. They wouldn't know the right people. They wouldn't know there would be things they didn't know, um, you know, and so this was designed by myself and um, one of my earliest protégés, Mark Hamelinen, um, about a year and a half ago, we had the first idea um, to, to kind of fix that. And Mark ran with it and it was a blowout success as measured this way. I think this is probably the most mind blowing piece of statistics I've, I've ever seen about an event of this nature. If you look at this, then, you know, they did this like, you know, uh, did the event exceed your expectations kind of standard thing. This was a couple of weeks after the event. And as you can see, obviously, this was all very good. 97% of the attendees say, said that the event exceeded their expectations. So that's great. But the thing I really want to highlight is the thing in the red box. Three quarters of the people who came in, of the 50 newcomers to the field, reported after two weeks after the event, they reported tangible outcomes, as you can see here. I mean, that is just like... That is just like completely impossible. That is like science fiction. It's just no way that happens. So, of course, I am overjoyed at the level of success here. And I'm not the only one. I'm um, delighted to say that this event will be repeated. The next iteration of it is happening in mid-January and applications are already open at lessdeath.org. Um, but I'm even more happy to say that I'm not even having to fund it anymore. Uh, because it was so successful that Mark and his team have been able to attract sufficient uh, financial resources from elsewhere that I can focus my resources on other things. So, um, you know, this is just like one of the things I'm most proud of, of the, of the um, activities that I've been involved in over the past year or so. And I very much encourage everyone to look up uh, lessdeath.org and understand what this event is about, and if you fancy attending, uh, possibly, since of course the people here tend to be rather knowledgeable people, if you uh, fancy attending, you might, uh, Mark might want you to be one of the counsellors this time, who does more of the teaching and less of the learning. So uh, yeah, please uh, educate yourself about this. Um, then I want to talk about Afro longevity. So uh, these two extraordinary people, uh, Osius from Nigeria, Brenda's from South Africa, uh, have created this thing called Afro longevity, which is a kind of subset of a broader thing across the whole of transhumanism called Taftis. Um, and Afro longevity is all about bringing the whole, well, educating the, the new continent, um, you know, the African continent about this whole area about what uh, is desirable, about what is being done, about how quickly it might actually uh, uh, come to any kind of fruition, and of course how to bring it to the countries in the world that have the lowest life expectancy today. And I cannot praise these two people too much. They pulled off a fantastic conference in August of this past year, um, which was the inaugural event, the launch event of Afro Longevity. Um, I was delighted to be there. Jose Cordero, who's in the audience today, was also there. And, um, you know, uh, it was just like, it really showed me that these people not only have dedication and determination and everything, but they also are ex exceptionally competent. And so, again, I encourage you to educate yourselves about this initiative and to think about how you might be able to help them to help the, um, the, the, the next billion people from, from a continent that has not had much role to play in this movement so far. All right, so um, the next thing I want to talk about is A4LI, the Alliance for Longevity Initiative. And this is a US-based and US-centric um, entity, but of course it very much has the potential to have parallels across the world, especially in Western Europe. And it's all about directly lobbying elected representatives, especially those in the national government in Congress. Um, there are various specifics to this that you can see at the bottom of this slide. But the key thing is that Congress has been a very tough nut to crack over the years. An organization called the Alliance for Aging Research has existed for 30 or 40 years trying to get our elected representatives in the US to pay attention to the idea that 
aging is quite a bad thing, and in particular that it's very, very expensive because money is a language that elected representatives tend to understand. And um, it's been pretty much completely ineffective. And we believe that the reason it's been ineffective, the number one reason, is because politicians fundamentally have decided that, yes, that would be all very well if we could even slightly postpone the health problems of late life, then wonderful, yes, we would save a lot of money and so on. But that aging is like gravity, there is no way that money is going to change it. And therefore, we are not interested in actually spending money to try to change it. Now, of course, as time's gone on and science has progressed, uh, that argument has become increasingly fragile. And we believe, and the A4LI believe, that now is the time when that argument has become so fragile that at least in the eyes of some of our elected representatives, it can actually be consigned to history. And we can actually get those politicians to, um, to advocate for and to vote for the allocation of considerably more money to more government money to the um, concept of postponing the health problems of late life. Of course, the very first talk yesterday from LADA, one of the most exceptional newcomers to the field, I must say, I can't speak too highly of LADA, um, uh, was exactly on this point. And LADA is um, working also with some of the people who are directly lobbying Congress on this. She explained how the goal there is to allocate money to rapid decision making on um, grant applications. And this is very complementary to that. Um, so then, uh, hello, talk to me. There we go. Um, then uh, the final thing I want to highlight in this talk is the Healthspan Action Coalition, which is headed by these six people, especially the top three, the board members. Um, the uh, idea here is to address the general public, and I mean the real general public, not people who have already bought into the idea that aging is a bad thing or that aging is a medical problem or, or that rejuvenation might actually work. You know, the, the people who are still living in the last century where they think, um, you know, aging is like gravity and we just have to manage it and make the best of our lives. Uh, as we all know, that still constitutes the large majority of the population. And especially it constitutes the very large majority of the elderly population. In the um, US, there is an organization called the AARP, the American Association for Retired Persons, which essentially, um, you know, epitomizes this. It uh, is an organization which nominally, ostensibly, is um, focused on benefiting the elderly. But when it comes to the idea that medical intervention might benefit the elderly, they run away very fast. So the Health Ban Action Coalition is designed to fix that. And the people here are, you know, if anybody can do it, they can. Bernie Siegel worked in, um, he's a lawyer by training, but he's worked in regenerative medicine for the past 20 years. And in particular, he ran, uh, he's run a conference for the past, I think, 18 years called the World Stem Cell Summit which is the uh, absolute foremost, worldwide foremost networking event in regenerative medicine. And Melissa King uh, was the founding executive director of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine and was also the leader of the campaign to get the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine refunded a few years ago. Uh, you will all know, I'm sure, that CIRM was funded as a result of a ballot initiative in California. In other words, the general public voted to have their taxpayers' money spent in very serious uh, amounts. It was $3 billion the first time, it was $5 billion the second time, and Melissa did all of that. Um, so these are the kind, and Sabrina Cohen uh, founded and runs one of the most successful medical charities. So we have people here who have the most extraordinary credentials, and all three of them have decided that now what they want to do is actually focus their efforts squarely on longevity and on rejuvenation. So drawing back from the broader focus on regenerative medicine that they had before. The people at the bottom are also absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, these have uh, a variety of different um, talents. Jofi Deva Kumar is my wife, so um, uh, she has plenty of talents. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, so this is an amazing team of people. Uh, we at LED Foundation are supporting this group financially at a reasonably higher level because we really believe that now is the time when these kinds of people can go out there and make a genuine difference to public attitudes and the public conversation on this. So I will actually, I think I'll just stop there and um, uh, mention that, of course, we have a website. Um, we have a nice donate page for anybody who's interested in helping us financially, but we also have um, updates there. The, the website is very much under construction because the foundation is very new. Uh, but the um, but but of course that's the place to go if you want more information. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions, of course. Okay, thank you, Aubrey, and uh, thank you for staying within the time slot that was uh, available. Okay, did you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Aubrey. Well, I have uh, many many questions, but. Uh, uh, I have many opportunities to ask questions so also, so I will uh, try to be uh, short in my questions, remark, remarks. The, the first one is, uh, well, thanks a lot for this, uh, uh, for uh, the less debt uh, initiative, this camp, it is really great. Um, I think it would be also great to organize such an event in, uh, in Europe. And uh, well, there was such an event, uh, I think two or three years ago, in uh, in Europe, uh, just before the, the COVID times, uh, um, organized by Open Longevity, um, uh, Eragova, uh, I forgot the first name, sorry. Um, and, yeah, and also at one moment, uh, Miroslav Radman uh, uh, in Croatia was one of the guys who was thinking about this. So yeah, I think we should uh, try to organize something uh, uh, also at the European site. Thank you very much for the information uh, concerning this new, well, this new group of uh, six people. There is already a name of the organization or I, I, it, I, I didn't get it. Health Span Maybe Action. you can say it immediately. Yeah, Health Span Action Sorry. Coalition. Um, so okay, thank you. Website, website healthspanaction.org. Um, yeah, in terms of your first point, um, absolutely. I mean, so, I sorry, I... Yeah, I, I will say my, 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 my last question and uh, or remark uh, uh, already. So, and concerning the, um, I forgot the name also, the um, Alliance uh, for Longevity Initiatives, uh, of course, like you know, uh, it would be great also uh, to do that in, uh, in Europe. There was this uh, European Longevity Initiative, but not any more very, very active, but uh, once again, great. Uh, and thank you also for your answers now. Right, so first of all, with regard to less death and similar things, absolutely, Mark and his team are very much intending to make it global. They definitely plan to do maybe three or four of these events every year, and they will absolutely not all be in California by any means, they will be around the world. As regards A4LI, um, yes, you're quite right. They make sense to do that globally as well. Um, the thing about A4LI is, um, you know, the American political system is a little bit unusual in the sense that, um, you know, lobbying and, you know, giving money to politicians is much more of a bigger deal than it is in uh, most of the countries that we all come from. Um, so, you know, the, the, the logic is a little different and the tactics are a bit different, but the overall goal, absolutely right. Okay, uh, Chelsea had the question. Uh, yes, uh, Aubrey, always good to see you. And this is your third foundation after Methuselah Foundation, Sense Research Foundation, LEV Foundation. So um, is this time different? Uh, and what has changed from the first two foundations to this and the acceleration of this uh, progress? Yeah, so I was actually chatting with one of my board members, Pat Nicklin, this morning about this. I think the best way I have to describe it is in concentric circles. You know, there's an audience, the kind of audience that A4LI and HAC are addressing, people who are still not really on board with the idea that aging is even a medical problem at all. Right. Um, and then there are people who understand that aging is a medical problem, but they haven't really got the hang of rejuvenation. They're still thinking in terms of supplements and, you know, no, maybe calorie restriction mimetics and so on. These are the kind of people who would donate to, you know, the Buck Institute or, the, or, or to the American Federation for Aging Research. 
And then there's people who are one step in from uh, further advanced than that, and they get the idea that aging is bad for you, it's a medical problem, and they also get the idea that rejuvenation is the way to go, uh, because they've kind of, you know, they've maybe they didn't get it when I first started saying it, but when the Hallmarks paper came out it, 10 years ago, it kind of, you know, convinced them. And those are the kinds of people who would have been come, who would who would donate to Sense Research Foundation, which is you know still very much the preeminent uh, pre-existing organisation that focuses on damage repair. But what we have at LEV Foundation is kind of uh, the tip of the spear, you know, the the centre of this. People who not only get that rejuvenation is the way to go. But actually, they also see that, you know, they, they take that to its logical conclusion. They are comfortable with the idea of longevity escape velocity, with the idea that we can progressively improve these therapies so as to be able to keep the same people youthful as time goes on, as they get chronologically older. And of course, this is an idea that I've been putting forward for a very long time. But unlike the general idea of rejuvenation, it is still something that many mainstream people run away from very fast. So it's definitely the area in which, number one, there is still too little going on, you know, far too little. And number two, it's the area in which perhaps, you know, I with my uh, belligerent uh, persona am best placed to uh, take forward. Okay, and the last question by Patricio. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Unmute myself, of course. I was saying it's so good to see you and you are always still our king. So now, if you can just say something out of the box about this African initiative, because I have been invited here by a uh, television who is devoted only to Africa and I didn't know what to say, so I have postponed the event. Okay. And it, these images you have shown, this enthusiastic, incandescent, and juvenation, I mean, they are young, they are just young. And the point is, how do you, how would you define just without papers, without nature papers, just what you think, the hallmark of the African aging problem, what, because you have to make a sort of shift uh, towards the poverty issue, you see, because this has nothing to do. So you have to subtract the poverty issue and try to understand what is the African aging, because they are so young. Okay, so um, I would say a couple of things. The first thing is that Africa is catching up when it comes to aging, catching up with the Western world. Uh, there is not a single country in the whole of the world now, including Sub-Saharan Africa, that has a life expectancy lower than 50. That only became true like seven years ago, right? And now it's already up to a minimum of 53 or something like that. So they are catching up fast. Aging is unquestionably the biggest medical problem in Africa, even bigger than malaria or whatever, already. Um, the second thing is that Poverty per se, well, I mean, as we know, the um, in the West, there is a lot of play made of this thing called the longevity dividend. I mentioned the importance of economics to politicians and policymakers in the West. That can still be true in sub-Saharan Africa as well. So that's something that they have in common. But then perhaps the first, the, the last thing I want to say is something that Africa has that perhaps is not so common in the rest of the world, which is, um, cultural diversity. One thing that always astonishes me about Africa is the enormously large proportion of people who speak like five languages. And, you know, that's a mindset thing. People who think like that, you know, people, who, people who speak a lot of languages from an early age, they just think differently from poor people like me who can hardly speak French, you know. So, um, you know, so I, I, I've emphasised that, 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 that the, the, the way of thinking, you know, the way of, the reason why I made a contribution 20 years ago was because I came into this field with a mindset that was of, of an engineer, which was completely different from the mindset of the rest of the field. It's the same deal. Diversity of mindset, whether it's in the science, whether it's in the education, whether it's in the advocacy. I'm sure all of you know that I have uh, been saying for quite a few years that when Liz Parrish came along and entered the field, 
it was a huge step forward just because she was speaking differently than me, right? She was saying the right kind of things in very different ways. And it's the same deal, right? So the diversity is the key. Okay. Got it. Okay. And, and Patricia, I will put you in touch with us. Yes, in thank you there. very much. So I can better prepare my... I have 15 minutes to talk. I better say something intelligent. <laughs> okay.